Good evening. Good evening. The Lord be blessed. Father, we lift up your name on high. Blessed Trinity, we worship and adore you. We thank you because you loved us so much and you came down on earth to show us the way. We ask, Lord, that yet again today you reveal to us even the weakness of human beings and teach us how to be godly. We confess our various iniquities that would have hindered the flow of your spirit at this hour of reflection. We ask that your power purify us, and your word that comes with power shall transform our lives. This is our prayers, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, friends. Yesterday, by the grace of God, we were able to look at Jesus Christ entering the city and how he wept. We also saw how he was able to sanitize the church and trying to make the church what it is supposed to be. We see again today different things that will help us to understand and know that Christ really came to save. Even though the heart of man is full of wickedness, the Christ came to teach us the way and to help us and to guide us and to bless us. Follow again today and you will be blessed. Today's passage will be a long passage. Luke Gospel chapter 20 from verse 1 to 47. A very lengthy passage. Time will not give us sufficiency to read through them one verse after the other. I will, in this hour of reflection, attempt an explanation in verses according to their subjects and then bring out the lessons thereof so we can learn something from it. So follow me as a background for this study today. I will lead us to read Luke chapter 20 verses 1 and 2. Follow me as we turn to the word of God. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, for now. But we are considering the entire chapter, 1 through 47. One day, as he was teaching the people in the temple courts and preaching the Gospel, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came to him. Tell us, by what authority are you doing this? They said, who gave you this authority? Now let's stop at that point. But in the course of our discussion, you will discover that everything stems out from here. Who gave you authority? Now, looking at what was done, verses 1 through 9 of this chapter 20 gives us an idea of how the authority of Jesus Christ was being questioned. The Bible says in the place we have just read of the classes of people, first it was the chief priests, two it was the elders of the people, three it was the teachers of the law. 
class of people, very spiritual, positioned persons in authority of religious affairs and the society affairs. They were people that were looked up to, people that could be trusted, people that were to give direction to the people, both in spiritual things and in physical things. So the whole people needed to listen to them. Now in chapter 19, verse 47, the Bible says, as the people were welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem, singing Hosanna in the highest, this same class of people called Jesus aside and said, Master, why not stop these people from making noise, from shouting? And Jesus said unto them, if you stop them from singing Hosanna to the Lord, even the stones will be raised and they will minister. Now, that was the basics. The crowd was a mixed crowd. Singing Hosanna, and yet amongst them were people who named <coughs> the praises of God. So that was the beginning of the problem. And in the following day, those things began to manifest in different ways. So in today's study and reflection, we will get to discover how these people mobilize other people and how they, 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 they were able to put themselves together all for one purpose, to destroy that which God had in mind for us. In that chapter, from verses 1 to 9, the Bible says, These people came to Jesus. They asked questions, By which authority are you doing this? Now, what is authority? Authority is power. Authority is that which gives us ability to exercise any responsibility given to us. Jesus was preaching and preaching in the synagogue, healing and delivering people. And they asked, who gave you the authority to do this? Today, such questions are being asked in our homes, in our churches, in our workplaces, even in relationship. By which authority are you doing this? Now, when such questions come, it is not really to know which authority, but there is always a motive behind to question what the authority is. So here we see was being questioned. And in attempt to give them an explanation that needed to meet the standard of divinity, even among men, Jesus told them a parable as found in verses 9 to 19. He told them about a man who planted a farm, a vineyard, who gave it out to tenants and traveled for a very far journey. While he was there, time came that the products from the land was fruitful. And he heard about it. He sent his servants, go to the man I gave the rain. Ask him to give me supplies. And the man went and was mistreated, the Bible says. He was humiliated and he was thrown away. He went back reported, my master, this is what happened to me. He said, maybe they misunderstood you. Maybe they did not recognize you. I will still send yet another person. So the Bible says, he sent yet another person. Who went? A servant. And they did the same to this servant. They mistreated the servant. They casted him away. The Bible says, the master did not relent. He still gave yet another opportunity. The Bible says he sent yet another servant to them. A third in number. And these people wounded the servant, mistreated the servant, and threw him out of the farm. The master, being a generous person, being somebody with a large heart, willing to accommodate. Now said, maybe, maybe they were treated that way because they were servants. I will send my son 
they hear to the plantation and export. Maybe when they see him, they will recognize him as Jesus Christ. The Bible says he sent forth his son. And when he was yet afar from that, they conspired. And they said to him, Behold, behold, the hay of his establishment is here. Let us kill him and see what happens in the future. The Bible says they took him, they killed him. Now, from the first story, now into the second story, the underlying fact is the issue of conspiracy. Is the issue of conspiracy. Now, the, in this day that Jesus went on this second day into Jerusalem. It was full of conspiracy. It was a day full of conspiracy. In all the cases we are going to look at, we will see an underlining factor, which was the issue of conspiracy, which is still a matter in our time today. Conspiracy in our home. Conspiracy in our businesses. Conspiracy in our places of conspiracy everywhere. So they conspired. They killed the young man. I don't want to tell you what next, but the master was angry at it. Now when Jesus Christ told them this parable, they started understanding. Is he talking about us? Is he making reference to us? Because they knew he was teaching them something. Yet another conspiracy session. When they discovered they could not succeed in the second attempt, the Bible says there was yet another conspiracy. In verses 20 to 26, it is recorded that these same people, these conspirators, gathered themselves. They mobilized their descendants. And the Bible says they sent one of them, some of them to Jesus as spies that they may find a way to trap him at his work. The Bible says they came. They came. And when they approached Jesus, they now asked him, Master, we know you are a man from God. We know that you speak the truth. We know that you teach what is right. We know that there is no partiality in you. And we know you are a teacher from God. Now, look at the, 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 the ways used. These are ways that were flattering. They were meant to make Jesus feel, oh, this one's truly recognized me. And maybe they would have, he would have forgotten himself in that episode. The Bible says, after they have said all, paid him all the tribute, they now came out with their plans. And what was it? The master, is it right for us to pay tribute to Caesar? For us to pay tax to Caesar? Now, what was their motive? It was intended to bring Jesus in confrontation with the authority. It was intended to make Jesus weaken by his statement. And then they would have now aroused the community and the authority unto Jesus that he is the one inciting the people to break the law. But the Bible says, when they said this, Jesus called them and said, Bring me the coins, bring me the notes. And they brought him. He asked them a question. Whose pictures are on it? And they say, Caesar. And he told them, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And to God what belongs to God. Today in our world, what do we see? When we want to compromise, when we want to enter into sin, when we want to indulge ourselves in anything, we call it giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. It is evil. 
Today we see people when they are pressured into fetish traditions, in quest for them to justify what they have done, they said they will give in to see that what they want to see. I was working in a community where an announcement was made in preparation for a traditional festival for New Year. And the town crier had announced every man, this is what you have to pay. Every woman, you must pay this thing. And bring some other things for the worship of the idol of the community. And when the church members decided not to do that, it was a big problem. They were summoned to the court. And we're privileged to attain with them as pastors in the land to defend the cause of the gospel. And the men that were in charge of justice now said, Jesus directed that should be given to Caesar and what belongs to God should be given to God. Now what were they trying to say? That Caesar deserves something. Let me clear an impression to us this evening that first Caesar belongs to God because he was created in the image of God. And if anything deserves to go to Caesar, it is going back to God the Creator. Caesar does not own anything. He never created the heavens nor the earth and cannot be qualified to claim ownership of anything. All things were made by God. We were created by God, just like Caesar was created. So in no disguise should a Christian, should our world indulge themselves in compromises, claiming that they are giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. It is the wrong context of applying the word of God. All belongs to God. And God requests of us righteousness in all standards. Therefore, no one should pretend like these people, thinking they are loyal to authority and commanding respect to authority by trying to dissuade Christians to indulge in iniquity. So these people had a wrong motive. The thanks be to God that Jesus again defeated their conspiracy by telling them Give to Caesar and then to God what belongs to God. The Bible tells us that God created the heavens, everything in them. And Shota Kakism teaches us that God is the maker, the owner, and the one in charge of everything. Therefore, everything must be given back to God. Caesar has nothing and cannot claim ownership of anything. When they discovered that that conspiracy could not work, the Bible says they still went on for yet another one. And this time, another class of people still in their category called the Sadducees. Maybe they mocked at the Pharisees, the chief priests and the elders of having failed. So they now came up with their own plan. What did they say? Jesus, we have something to say. And Jesus paid attention to them, as recorded in verses 27 through 40 of Luke chapter 20. They came to Jesus. They quoted the scriptures. One thing I have noticed is that whenever a Christian is to be deceived and given an opportunity to compromise, the basis is always the wrong quotation of the scriptures. Or maybe the wrong use of the scriptures. So they came to Jesus and said, Moses in Mosaic law had told us that if a man marries a wife and dies without having children, his brothers are to take over. His brother is to take over and raise the children in the name of the late brother. That was true. Moses instructed and it was so. And this man, because they have selected which scriptures they want to believe, and why they were looking up to, was how to debunk the idea of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they said, there was a young man 
who married a wife and he died without having issues. The second brother took turn and also died without a mission. Success, succession continued. And the seven brothers all died. None of them had an issue. Jesus, we hear you teach about resurrection. When resurrection morning shall come, which of these seven brothers shall marry this woman? Wow, wonderful question. Technically put up, but foolishly presented. Because only a carnal mind will appreciate the level of their foolishness. The Bible says, what they never knew is that Jesus Christ is omniscience. He knew their thoughts. He knew their plans. So Jesus Christ, teaching them again at this time, made them to understand that marriage is a gift of God for us as we are alive. It's a gift of all God for those that are alive. That is what we need to know. When we are alive, we receive the gift of marriage. As we enjoy the gift of marriage, it boosts up our relationship. It boosts up our activities in companionship, propagation, and to replenish the earth. That is how it was created, just for this generation. So Jesus told them, Jesus told them, that like it was in the days of Noah, so they are giving in marriage and taking in marriage. But that is not so at the resurrection morning. For then, no man in mortal flesh will be able to stand before God. The Shorter Catechism teaches us that God created the world as a place where we live. See, the world, the earth is a place where we live. It is like a house in which our mortal body lives in. It is where our soul lives. Meaning that when our souls are out of it, this mortal body is back to the ground. So, nobody will go this way to stand in heaven, talkless of attempting to marry. Souls don't marry. And only souls will approach God and stand before him. Only souls. So Jesus Christ made them know and understand that at resurrection, there will be no marriage. So none of these brothers will marry that woman. But everyone will stand as soul before God. One thing I notice in these scriptures is that after Jesus gave this answer, even the Pharisees, the elders and the chief priests, said, well answered, well answered. I, in reading this, I understand they must have been mocking the Sadducees who thought that the Pharisees had failed. They could succeed. So their conspiracy in this level too could not succeed. And then Jesus Christ, having overcome all the conspiracies, in verses 41 to 47, specifically in 46, say unto them, Beware, beware of hypocrites. Beware of hypocrites. Beware of hypocrites. Now we have people who are hypocrites. And in that verses, Jesus Christ now told them, that the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the elders, all those people who have been part of this conspiracy from the beginning are the hypocrites. They are the hypocrites. Their purpose is not that God be glorified, but that they may mislead people and destroy them. No wonder Jesus Christ raised the warning, beware of these hypocrites. He described them by their garments. He described them by their salutation. He described them by their seats. 
He described them by the way they dispossess people to make themselves wealthy. No wonder he cried when he looked at Jerusalem. Because everything was still. Today, what do we see? You do good to people, like the man who planted the vineyard. What do we get from it? Conspiracy, enmity, and wickedness, even death. Today, in the church, we are not even spared. Conspiracy. Among the elders of the church, among the pastors of the church, among the bishop, the reverence. Conspiracy, ganging up. It has destroyed the churches. It has destroyed the houses. No church is perfect. No church is exempted. Many of us have become part of these things. And Jesus Christ, looking into it, is calling us at this moment of reflection that we need a church. We need a pastor. We need to make a new church. Elders, pastors, ministers, whatever title we call ourselves, Jesus Christ, who wants us against every form of conspiracy. If we teach the word with the right message, I know sincerely, we should lead the people and stop the divide and rule system. This one is my own. This one is not my own. We should stop listening with a wrong motive. What authority is he saying it? Why is he saying it? What does he have in mind? We should stop raising people to fight other Christians. We should rather think of how the church of God can move forward. From today's reflection, we see conspiracy in every sense. God is calling us to live family. He came to show us the way that these things are bad and to command us to turn to Jesus Christ. He told us the way. As we looked at the characters of the Pharisees, the elders and the chief priests, let us also look at do we see us, ourselves in them? Do we see our attitude in them? Do we see the way we act like theirs? If yes, then we are the people now that need to change. He call on us to live. As we prayerfully believe the passion of Jesus Christ to make us for our sake.
Bless us. Bless our family. Bless our world. Bless your church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. By the grace of God, tomorrow we will continue again by 6 p.m. for the third day reflection as we march with Jesus through this passage.